Hot burgers cooked medium. And you're going to hear in the background that the food's just coming out. So we're <laughs> jealous. Perfect. And Shelly has agreed to take one for the team. She's going to go first when her uh, when her eggs and pork chops are coming out. So <laughs> you can tell everybody what the, and you're going to hear. There we go. Well, Jim, I'm impressed you understand how to do all this. What's that? I'm impressed that you understand how to do all this. Oh, is that right? I wouldn't call myself a Zoom master, but <laughs> you know, I, I can I can stumble my way through this uh, without too much trouble. Uh, yeah. uh, so. Of course, I might. Uh, oh, here we go. There we go. Get get the right one up here. All right. That's me. You can set that thing right down there. And in fact, so here here's what the burgers look like. I also uh, have a. <laughs> Do you see it? Wow. Thank you, Jim. That uh, medium rare mushroom burger, french fries on the side, and and the sweet tea is so sweet that you can set your spoon in and it'll stand up straight. So. <laughs> well, that looks a whole lot tastier than the H E B salad I had for lunch. So. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> I'm a little little jealous. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the whole idea. <laughs> that was the whole. Idea. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. We're going to get this cranked up. All right, everybody can see the screen okay? Perfect. All right. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Shelly Corey. Uh, you will see there is her picture. And she, she says that that's completely unretouched. So. And it's know. not really 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, it's not really 10 years ago. <laughs> no, I think her hair is just a little shorter today. But other than that, so there's her, um, there's all of her bio information. And she's going to go ahead and kick things sure. off. So I'll swap chairs here. Hello, can everyone see and hear me? Everyone online? I can. Hey, Tori, are you good? I'm good. Hey, um, I just wanted to say thank you to Jim and the IEDD board. It's been some time since I've been here. We used to have groups of 150 plus and pack the room. So with COVID, this is my first time to do a hybrid uh, presentation of this nature. I like the fact that it's a small group. Uh, I welcome any questions. I know the topic for the day is automating the drilling process. Uh, I spent 20 years with Baker Hughes, so did everything right from drilling, main, mainly drilling, um, did a little bit with the motors, uh, spent a lot of time on ESPs, chemicals and pumps and did the pressure pumping, merging of BJ services for three years and back to drilling and Unfortunately, uh, one of the rare casualties, right, of the COVID downturn in the oil and gas market, 20 years at Baker and my job went away. So I've been with Betcoff Automation. It is a wonderful company. Okay. And I'm gonna share with you some of the things that we're doing. Um, Betcoff Automation, I started with them in July. And I do encourage any questions, comments, interjections. We've got a few sitting here. Um, so just speak up. If, if I go too fast, if you can't hear me, or if you have some really good questions and comments. All right. So what I'm, I'm going to talk out, I'm going to kick it off before I hand it over to Troy. And what I want to focus on is why all of us, right? All of us to really consider oil, oil and gas automation, right? Even if we're operators, uh, even if we're original equipment manufacturers, uh, any 
any service companies, right? Like Baker that I mentioned, we have Halliburton uh, sitting here in the audience. Uh, any service company, Scout and Gordon Technologies walked in here a second ago. So we've got a few people on the service company side. We all need to care and be interested in oil and gas automation. But it even goes further than that. And I do think IADD can play a big role. I think the open technology standardization of how we automate in the oil and gas industry is a big mi missing component. So key people outside of our OEMs, our, our rig owners, um, operators and service companies, right? Are organizations like IADD. There are the data architects. They are the programmers, the PhDs. We got one from A&M sitting in here. Um, software companies, right? Automation companies like Betcoff Automation. All of us need to be talking together. We need to kind of work in sync to make sure the path forward that we can share our technologies. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more and uh, next about a little bit more what is that cough automation. Uh, I'm gonna share some case histories. It's a handful of what we're doing today. And I would encourage, you know, we've got a small group to be open and end on a round table of where we can go next. Okay, what is oil and gas automation? It can be defined a million different zillion ways. I just threw up my first thought of what it could be, right? And it is some form of digital technology. It utilizes sensors. And there's a whole bunch of different sensors out there collecting the data. For Beckhoff, we usually take from a sensor and we put it into our system to help do what it needs to do in the internet of things, so to speak. So to me, oil and gas automation is anything digital technology, utilizes sensors. It could be based on an internet of things, uh, hardware electronics, transmissions of data. AI is a really, really big word. Usually along with that is the machine learning. Um, any complex programming. In the past, especially when I was with Baker, you know, we're all trying to automate and, and move forward, but we really didn't care about our IT group, so to speak, our electrical engineers, our instrumentation groups. And now those are the ones that may have a driver's seat that need a seat at the table as we move forward and develop you know, our automation. So what does open system automation really mean? Open means for everyone to be able to tap into, use and share. System automation is bringing it all together to predict, it's to control, it's to monitor everything we do from a functional standpoint and operations in the oil and gas industry. And that really does mean, you know, we're, we're thinking rig automation, but what we learn in automation and what we know from automation can be upstream, right? Drilling, uh, motors, it can be the completions, it can be the fracking, it can be all the way to the ESPs to production downstream measurement, um, midstream pipeline, all the way into the refineries and the chemical plants. There are extreme lessons learned in those industries that we can all put together to advance um, our drilling automation. Does that make sense? All right, who are some players? These are some players that uh, Betcoff works quite well with. Uh, NOV, Novus, you know, they've automated some rig steps. Franks International, Premier, I spoke to Lee this morning, had coffee with them. They do casing running tools, right? Uh, neighbors, the can rig on automation there. Rig of the future with Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, GE Drives, Weatherford. I think we had some uh, cement plugs that we worked with them on and, and Halliburton, okay? Those are just a few that are dabbling into the automation world. But I do think we operate in silos, right? So the big goal here for me is to realize that we need to work together for that open system automation. Okay. Now, what's driving the future? Well, there are a few bullet points I threw in here. This is not all or inclusive. Really the operators, right? Pioneers who have their own rigs, others, operators, big ones, the big ones, the small ones, onshore, offshore, they need a, a return on investment but it's right now in a time where the cost of drilling is, is very important. Um, we have to improve efficiencies, even from considering hydrogen as a solution for minimizing the efficiency. We've got, we've got pockets of our customers dabbling in that. And it's to survive, 
right? Um, this downturn is ugly. Um, it's still going to be here a while. I know we peaked what sixty-five dollar a barrel oil it dropped through a, a little below sixty. It's it's survival mode. We've lost a tremendous amount of experience from our crews to our drilling <laughs> engineers. I don't know if they're coming back, right? Um, so we've got to learn to develop automation. I do think automation for for rig automation for drilling. It's a stepping stone, right? We have to become a greener energy provider. And I think the automation can help us step in that direction and it's demanded, right? Another reason for automation is our consistency, right? We can always continuously improve through consistency and we can offer improved safety, right? If we reduce the personnel that's out on a rig floor to get the job done, less touch points and automate them more, we obviously increase safety. I've got a few examples to highlight that even more. Even safety as it may take it to hazardous zones when we're drilling in, you know, zone zeros or, or, or things of that nature. Automation, you know, can also provide the intrinsic safety for zone zero. Automation allows users to use their cell phone to make real-time decisions to change the pump flow on a chemical pipeline. Believe it or not, we are all doing that today. Um, it's just not widespread and it's not through open technology. Um, collecting data, a lot of that data analytics is really driven from decisions that needs to be collected to do a study point. Um, we do it in a lot of aspects right now. Right? Uh, Baker did it for bit record collection, but it was data analytics that we collected way after the fact to try to do something with. Even hooking up with companies like Porva to do their graphical interface right on the rig. If you walked into a drilling rig, of uh, you know, in the, into the, in the field, they would have some kind of analytics up. But it was usually looking way, way, way back in history, and nothing real time for them to make decisions as they're drilling that rig. Um, say if it was a ten well pad, they can't really make decisions on that one well pad quick enough when they slide over to drill, like say the next twelve and a quarter vertical section. It's twelve thousand feet. Real time decisions with data analytics needs to be quicker. Um, also, another really, really big aspect uh, us at Backhoff are starting to realize is preventive maintenance. If we can reduce downhole failure, that's huge. And I've got a case history or two to kind of talk about that. There are, I'm sure, many, many more points that are missing, but those are just a few highlights that I grabbed. Um, so I'm gonna dive into case histories, right? I, I like the proof in the pudding. What's the value? What do we get out of oil and gas automation? Our operators, our customers, uh, government entities require certain standards to meet. Um, how, do, how can we automate that to make our lives easier? So I'll talk handful, maybe five, six case histories here. They do stem everything from upstream, midstream and downstream. Uh, two of them are really focused on rooms, which is really what we're here about. A little bit more about Beckhoff automation. Uh, who is Beckhoff? Where we are actually the pioneers in system automation. Uh, we provide new open system control within industrial PCs to advance controller technology. And there's a few other players out there. Um, but we really are driven by providing an end solution for our customers. We collaborate with a lot of service companies per se. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I think I think the speaker notes, plain and text to me that the speaker notes are showing up, not the thing. So oh. let me stop the share. Oh. I mean, they're seeing the slide, but they're seeing this one. Oh, here's the slide. <laughs> See, I don't have that problem. <laughs> okay, let's get the right screen here now. There we go. There it is. Okay, we got it. How do I minimize this little big window yeah, in front of me? All, all we have to do is go back. There thank you. you. Thank right, you. Nice. Thank, oh, thanks, Blaine. Okay. Yes, thank you, Blaine. I didn't know you were on. Um, so just to end, Betcoff, uh, we provide four key component areas, industrial PCs. That's really something like this. I didn't know what this was. This is the brains of that houses the software, that TwinCat software 
It's PLC program logic sitting inside of a brain to run what I call the arms that you can bolt on and build and scale it to run the IO. It's the inputs, the outputs, the digital inputs, the digital outputs, the analog inputs, all that good stuff. RTDs, all, all of it that sensors come in to the IOs to speak to the brain and all the magic works through TwinCAT software platform is what I call it. And what that is, TwinCAT software is a platform, it's Windows based. Uh, we have other entities that works uh, um, Berkeley as well. But what it does, it, it allows anybody who's done coding for automation in the drilling industry, you can bring it in. You can bring in six different main languages. Um, we were also just talking here, you know, with NRK uh, from uh, MATLAB, right? And Simulink and all that. So ladder logic, structured text, different function charts. Uh, we can bring that programming language into the TwinCat automation software platform to make all the magic happen, okay? And that is a really quick overview of what Betcoff Automation can provide and others in the industry can provide to help rig automation occur. Um, the motion, we have server motors and things of that nature. I won't go into too much detail. We've got the HMI with the control panels, touch screens, anything what, from seven inches up to 24 inches is our normal sizes for that. And we work with integrators, we call them big. It's the Betkoff Integrator Group. So we don't do programming per se. We've got some experienced people that helped, you know, actually in the Novus project with NOV program. Um, so we can help build the solution package for you outside of the scope of what you see here for, for Betkoff Automation. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, chat. Okay. Yeah, if there are any questions, Jim's going to read them maybe, or if he can, and let me know. If not, y'all just speak up. This is very informal. Um, so here's the first case history. This is uh, for blowout preventers, right? How do, we autom how do we provide an automated solution to monitor and control? We all know the importance of blowout preventers, right? This project was over in the UAE. It was for multi-master controls with the CX industrial PCs that spoke to remote located blowout preventer units, right? And you can see that below on the bottom, just two different extended uh, blowout preventer units. You can daisy chain, you can do whatever you want. You can have multiple units connected, okay? This is just to say it really doesn't take much in regards to an industrial PC with some IO, with some automation software like TwinCat to make all of this happen, okay? All that you see over on the right-hand side was probably less than $3,000 to get this job done. So what they wanted to do, they needed to monitor, they needed to control, they needed to make sure they seal off any gas leak on this uh, blowout preventer. And the end customer, right, really needed to use some acquisition, some communication from this master control unit to speak to those blowout preve preventer units that are out in the field, okay? So they had a CX8030, probably 300 bucks, Atom processor, I believe. It provided the communication. It emulated and talked to Siemens. So there's others in the industry. We do have devices that allow you to connect seamlessly with others in the industry. Okay, we used a Profibus slave device to do that. Okay, along with that, some digital input, output, analog input, analog output, two channel, high, you know, we can go all the way up to 16 channel, believe it or not. We also incorporated, it might not really be seen here, the safety part, right? There are some yellow terminals, some blue terminals. It's the intrinsic safety if you need it, depending on your code requirements. ATEX, NEC 505, anything that may talk zone zero, div one, class one, you have certain requirements and you can provide IO, so to speak, to meet that requirement, okay? So it's a lot smaller footprint than other barriers. 
And again, the TwinCat software platform allows that pro program logic to work between your slave devices extended in the field all the way back to your control master. Okay. Are there, are there any questions on this quick case history? Okay. Here's a cool one. This is out in a refinery, or this is a, a downstream plant in Dubai, and it's actually a smelter unit, which takes aluminum, it, it, takes the, it oxidizes it to the alumina through a very, restrict, very, very, very strict process. It's a high temp process in order to get what they need. So they really had to have a high temp control on their temperature and their voltage. So again, just a, an industrial rugged PC we offered to them. Uh, along with some temperature uh, RTDs, right? Those are the resistant thermo deterministic couplers that they input. Um, I think operating temperature was around 140. I think they pushed it higher than that. Our IO survived 160 degrees Fahrenheit. They had over thousands of different IO connected to make sure that they can manage the temperature and the voltage control and they had to collect the data from multiple locations spread out through this, um, this plant, right, to deliver that process. And they did use it over EtherCAD. And EtherCAD is a Betcoff product, but it is an open system product, meaning there's a group EtherCAD, there's over a thousand members, and everybody knows it's open technology. They can grab it, they can use it as we move forward in this automation uh, solutions for customers, okay? Um, they use a little bit of fiber optics and they pushed it over a protocol that might be Greek to many of us, TCP IP. And we can talk about that in more detail later. <laughs> All right, this is a really, really cool case history. Um, it's a company out of Australia. Uh, this case history, they're, they're, they're actually back in the States. So what they needed to do was put up a tent and regulate the welder safety when they're in their refineries and chemical plants, okay? So what they needed to do is have a control system in a hazardous area, uh, monitor the pressures, they needed to detect any gas leaks, um, and they needed to be a, a quick erect system to bring in and out of different locations. And they needed to vent and deaerate the gases to minimize any risk. So in short, you know, uh, a controller of Batkoff was used some of the ELX intrinsic safety zone zero type IO to prevent um, and to help protect in those hazardous zones was used. Um, through all of that with their IO, they could set alarms, right, and triggers to let you know if there, there is a leak. Um, you can control the airflow with the IO and, and the hardware there from a system automation standpoint. And it, it got the job for them. And, and we're actually, they came back and they're, they're starting to set up shop again, so to speak, in the US. Very good customer. All right. I have to speak very high level. This is probably one of the most exciting case histories I came across. And I do not cover NOV specifically, my colleague does. And what you see here is really what you can find on, on their website. And the beauty of what they did is truly take 13, a dozen steps or so of the drilling rig automation and they automated it, right? So all the way from a, a drilling engineer with his well prog, right? I got a well program, I've drill, drilled this kind of well, I need 12,000 feet, set casing here, I got a kickoff point and a build up rate and then I got a whole tangent and hit my landing spot. All of those methods are, are a recipe we all know in our well progs. If we get really, really good at it, and when we can get drilling rig automation teed up perfectly, we can, we can do more than what we've just, just done here in silos. But what they did, right, they needed to improve the safety, they wanted to minimize the risk, they wanted to follow the well prog, and they wanted to be repeatable. Everybody wants the same well when they shift over or move over on a walking rig, right? So the solution did incorporate, and, and and you know, we work with others, right? It, it is a group effort to deliver a solution. Um, Betcoff didn't have a, a big finger in this pie, um, but what we did is, you know, on the programming side assist and the outcome was they did remove hoisting up, open the blowout preventer, open in the slips, start in the pumps, right? Begin your rotation, hit tag bottom with the bit, bring back up. Um, 
all those steps were automated in one click. All right, I won't read them all, but what it did is it completed a dozen cycles in 20 minutes and thir that 13 step cycle that I just mentioned, right? It did 11 cycles of those. It could do it in 20 minutes versus five. It improved the efficiency by 120%. And it reduced the personnel footprint, right? By 25% in one shift, okay? It's that crew consistency that we used to talk about uh, that we used to gauge and follow and track when I was over at Baker Hughes and operators were following it. It brought a little bit more consistency when you are drilling to, to repeat that confident process. And it does help drive the rig of the future. Okay, it's very, very good case study. Here is a uh, second to my last case history. This is actually ADNOC, right, in uh, UAE. And they own over 100 rigs, I think 102 rigs. So they really wanted to, to eliminate or minimize, right, downhole failures. Bearings is one of them, right? Anything from their top drives to their draw works to mud pumps. They begin to realize how important condition-based monitoring, you may see it abbreviated CBM, right? And bringing any machine learning into that. Well, again, it takes a slew of people to develop a logarithms to work with the mathematical development of what do we need to do to understand. I got a curve over here on the left-hand side. It's that risk management, probability of failure curve. Um, and it's taking your data and storing it. They used our servers to store the data. They collected the data. They ran it through a um, human machine interface. It's really a touch screen with things that you can touch and move and do uh, on monitors and using the software um, with machine learning. They were able to do predictive vibration analysis that would help them deter downhole failure. That is so very important important in the drilling environment today. Even if you're a motor down hole, it's an expensive piece of jewelry. Even if you're electrical submersible pump, that's a quarter of a million dollars down hole, you don't want that one to <laughs> lock up or seize up or have a gas lock on it and not work. This is so very important. Um, I'm just learning bits and pieces of it, but it is a lot of people that work together. But the controllers, the screen touch HMI, software, the high-end I.O. Um, now we do have high-end measurement I.O. with Beckhoff. Some of these I.O. slice cards, you know, these little bitty terminals that are half inch wide, very lightweight, um, can be 50 bucks, 60 bucks, 100 bucks. Some high-end measurement, right? Vibration ones can, can be over $1,000 and they're worth it. So we develop any need that customers bring to us. Frank's is a really big customer of ours. Uh, we're helping them on, on automating their console for their Century 5 project. So I, I want to bring it to others in the industry that might be missed with this technology, right? That's the whole purpose of this. And to kind of end, and I'm Troy, I'm staying on time. I got one more minute here. Yeah. Um, just to really say, everybody hears the buzzword, sensor to cloud automation. Really? Can I be on my iPhone? Can I touch a button? Can I open a valve? Can I turn on a pump? Uh, yes, you can. And some of people are doing it. But how it communicates. This is a very, this is a company called Oil and Gas Solutions. They do not mind me mentioning their name. They filed for a patent to automate system control for chemical injections and treatment in midstream pipeline industry, period. Um, not anybody has done a big blanket, take a step back, IoT, sensor to cloud automation. Different projects we're dabbling with right now. Uh, pig launchers, right? If you don't know what those are, it's just putting a big old pig, porcupine looking thing through the pipeline to really clean it up, right? After you push a pig through a pipeline, that's the time to do chemical treatment, not just a drip every now and then on a regulated schedule, right? to improve a solution for midstream pipeline companies, this is really big for them. It's like you wax your car after you wash it, right? Well, how come I can't trigger my chemical pump to turn on to pump so much uh, different chemicals in it after my pig launcher is launched? This is a big time manual process today, okay? Anything to disperse different chemicals, if there's a freeze in the system to tank leveling, all that good stuff, 
that is a part of the sensor to cloud automation. This is just one little baby example. This is a little bit more detailed. Um, really what it does is the bottom level of this image is like a robot, a CNC, a lathe. That's all shop stuff, right? But we can be in the field. We can take what input comes from a sensor into one of our IO slices, digital or analog, RTD, whatever it may be. We can push it to a broker. Mosquito is kind of a popular one that manage that communication protocol to bring it to the cloud. Even people like AWS, Azure, and all of them, Microsoft, they're a part of this, right? Pushing it to the cloud, pushing it to the server to save the data, to push it to the end use of seeing it on your screen in the office versus in the field and making decisions real time. That is what I really mean when I talk sensor to cloud automation, okay? So this is my last slide, and this is kind of an open forum. Um, I do think a lot of us develop automation in silos, from operators to company service to PhDs, and the right hand's not talking to the left hand, and we don't know how to walk in unison, and we're going to get ourselves in trouble. So open automation is key. EtherCAT, that's open automation, right? Our programming languages, IEC 61131-3, you know, we all talk to each other. The pharmaceutical industry, that coughs in a lot of industries, so I see it from the pharmaceutical side. They're standardized, they got rules. Everybody oper operates by the same game playing rules. So we, as we automate drilling and everything else in the oil and gas industry, we all need to be talking to each other and setting some guidelines. I don't know if that's with operators. I don't know if that's with the original equipment manufacturers, international, all, all or the all the above maybe. And you know, this is just a kickoff for us to share knowledge. Uh, I would be delighted to share more and take deeper dives and take the next step. Um, and I think strategy meetings, you know, of kind of talking about this in a more serious round table. We, we used to have sessions at IADD that would bring half a day sessions in and we'd break out in groups and really dive into this. So we're, we're here at Beckhoff's here to help drive those conversations if, 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 if it's seen of value. Done good. good. I did good. <laughs> All right. Any questions or anything? So there's something up in the chat. Let me. Oh, uh, okay. See. I'll let I'll let him I'll get the chat you. window open. And then what we can do is probably get you know, Troy go through mm -hmm. and all that session. We'll have chat. While the chat about the chat. Well, now you can eat your. Great, Great job, Shelly. Thank you. This is part two. All right. Now, Troy, did did you want to share your screen, or do you want me to just go through the one that you have? Uh, I can try to share it if you want. Okay. Well, then let me stop sharing. Oops, we're having, we're having some mouse troubles here. <laughs> I know that feeling. Really. I can't, I can't get, see the mouse isn't hitting the, the right spot. Let me end the show. Maybe this is. Uh, I've got a nice screen on here. Right, you can probably go ahead. You can go ahead and share your screen. There we go. All right. Operate. There you go. We got it. Operating with two screens is uh, proving to be a challenge here. <laughs> Especially when you only have one. Well, yeah, I've got one, but one's on my screen and one's on the big screen. So. Mm. So can you see that, the big screen of the, yeah. that says Automation Solutions? Yeah, that popped up. Yeah. 
Are you ready? Jim, can you hear me? They went on mute. Yeah, yeah I, sure. I had muted myself. Uh, so oh. you're, you're good for it. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Okay, so uh, I guess it's good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Troy Oni. I, uh, I currently work for H&P Drilling. Uh, we are a oil and gas rig supplier and uh, provi uh, service provider. Uh, so what I wanted to speak to you today, uh, so a little bit of history, like Shelly, I, I had uh, almost 35 years with Baker Hughes from assorted positions of mostly in the drilling side, uh, some cementing, liner hangers, drill bits, directional drilling, uh, drilling fluids. So uh, a little bit of a, of a tainted past. Uh, recently, I've, I've got about four years now with H&P. And, uh, and uh, it was an interesting transition. I had never really worked in the, in the drilling rig surroundings. And so it was a good transition for me to bring that, that drilling knowledge into the H&P organization. And so what I wanted to speak to you today about is some of the automation solutions that, that, uh, that drilling contractors are working through. And then some of the aspects in which uh, I have uh, taken note over the last two or three years, uh, coming from uh, a background of the, of the downhole drilling environment and moving it to the drilling rig environment and how that, how that progresses. So I will tell you that uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, that uh, we have seen in the automation side of the business from the from the drilling side, obviously uh, the directional drilling was one of the kind of the first real big jumps. But prior to that, it was more of the automation of the rig and how that worked. Uh, I will jump to the next slide here. Uh, the biggest challenge I think we have is it is uh, the, uh, the technology versus the philosophy. And what that means by is, is that very much like Shelly was pointing out, we can automate uh, lots of aspects of the drilling process, but the challenges uh, sometimes we face may be fairly hard to overcome and they may be uncomfortable for some people to realize what they would be. Uh, and why I mean by uncomfortable is how, why are you removing uh, my directional driller? My driller is the best driller I've ever seen. He can put BHAs back on bottom. He knows how to drill the well. I am the company man that's been out here for 30 years. I have the tribal knowledge to know how to drill this. I don't need your help. Those kinds of aspects are really good to have. They're, they're very notable and very valuable, but being able to scale it to past 12 hours or eight hours or two days or one well, that becomes the challenge. And then all the aspects that, that come into those automation processes of what you're doing. Uh, I find it very interesting that the challenges that we, you know, the, the, the challenges that we have is understanding how that automation service affects other parts of the drilling operation and or is influenced. Um, so you really don't understand what the left side and right side are doing when you are running an oscillator and you're trying to put your BHA back on bottom. Are you actually affecting different parts or not? And understanding what that means and how does that affect you? So the driver really becomes, uh, what is that open communication which what Shelly has talked about is what is that open communication of how we make sure that everyone is all directed in the same or, or focused on the same direction and making sure that the end result is what we all consider to be a win for all of us. Uh, 
it, there is uh, some critical change management and communications parts that have to be discussed prior to any operation happening. Uh, I will tell you, uh, unfortunately, here recently, uh, we tested uh, ROP enhancement on one of our rigs for a customer, and we were told we'd just push the button and it'll work. And um, it didn't. <laughs> it was it was not the success that we all thought it should be. And, and unfortunately, uh, we should have stepped back. So I know people have said in the past, oh, no, we take care of that. We don't do that. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, it, it's happened to the last 30 days. So those kind of aspects do happen all the time. Uh, understanding those KPIs. So what I would like to do is I'm going to quickly kind of go through some of the aspects of what uh, we do from a drilling automation perspective. And I'll also bring up some points to where uh, hopefully it stimulates your, either your thought process or your comments or, or, or your or conversation. Um, I will tell you that one of the driving factors is and where a lot of people understand in automation is it always is like very, uh, very important to have a good starting foundation. Uh, Shelly's comment about the the uh, the pipeline automation and chemical probably is driven by they all have the same system. They all communicate to the same. They all have the same interaction. There are one or a thousand positions to add that. So that continuity and understanding and consistency of the same kind of baseline is important. And I think that's one of the things that we kind of bring to the table is because of these, these operating systems in the rig being similar to each other, very like very much like NOV does on their system, it makes it much easier to incorporate these automation uh, services into the operation. I will say uh, after uh, several years of directional drilling in bits, it does help to have the rig being the center of the driver of the automation. I do believe that, that, that uh, the fact of it going through that rig operation system and that large piece of equipment on location makes a big difference. <clears throat> the first one, and, and, I, and, and, and a lot of people actually know this stuff about the oscillator and the different parts of uh, for making sure that weight get to the bit in a, in a motor application is important. I think what ends up happening is KPIs also drive this a lot. And, and we've, we've seen a couple of opportunities where, you know, do you start the oscillator when your BHA is on bottom or off bottom? And how does that, how does that success look like? Because at the end of the day, we were trying to reduce that time in the curve or, in, or changing the, the borehole or changing the wellbore direction and using that in the slide mode. So I thought it was really interesting to, of having some KPIs around that idea. But that automation side of, of driving the top drive is key. Now remember, when I start talking about some of these things, remember that you can actually put these pieces together when I get to the end of this. Another one is, uh, which, which I find uh, extremely interesting from, uh, from a drill bit perspective, these next two. <coughs> it's not, it, it is talking about having the automation of putting the device to remove rock. That's what we're talking about, is putting it back on bottom consistently every time. Uh, I don't know if any of you have, have made the opportunity to see some of the, the labs of some of the bit suppliers, but most of them have a cutter test <coughs> where they systematically test cutters to where they can consistently find out if they're going to live or survive through a granite block. <coughs> and they'll do that with the consistency of doing it the same way every time. Excuse me. <coughs> that, that, in, that in itself 
helps you to understand how the cutter will react. So in a drilling operation, when you can consistently put the product back on the bottom the same way, always is a benefit to the product in doing it every time the same way. Now you can run it manually versus the machine. And that's kind of the way we kind of judge what that looks like. But the way I talk to customers about this is uh, 200 connections. It takes you about the, the difference is if you save a minute in 200 connection, that's 200 minutes times about $35 a minute is your cost is your operating cost. So you can waste $7,000 a day very easily or, or a well very easily by just doing it manually or not the same way. The next one, uh, which, which I talked to about is ROP enhancement is actually applying that rotary and, uh, and weight on bit to the drilling to the drill bit to actually remove rock. And this is the one where I recently spoke to a, a group about how many influential points there are into this. So you can imagine if you're going to automate this service, how you would think it's just basically putting in some parameters and saying, go back to bottom. But actually, if you don't know what the formation is, you don't know what the formation strength is, you don't know what type motor it is. You don't know how what the fluid rate is. You don't know what the, uh, the solids control is. You don't know if they're stabilizers or not. <coughs> you, you don't know if the driller is in a bad mood or not, or even understands what's going on. There's, there's so many types of communication that need to be shared to make sure that everyone's on the same table, on the same page. And while, uh, at the beginning of my career at h &P, we had this where you just go out and turn it on and push the button. This is a, this is a, a very intense process now of making sure we understand all the aspects that a drill bit is required to drill. That interbedded formation has not gone away. It's still there. And when you run into a 20,000 PSI rock at 600 feet an hour, something is going to give if you don't know that. And those are, the, those are the aspects that you need to understand. And it happens. It, it happened three weeks ago in West Texas. Uh, so it does happen, and it still does. Uh, but this ROP enhancement of, of letting the machine run the weight on bit and RPMs is a great way to do it, but you need to, have, you need to provide it with a roadmap of what is expected to come up. The next one is, is uh, from a mitigation standpoint, is that vibration of the drill string and how each time we put that drill string back to work, that we've actually uh, uh, made sure that we watch and, and not let the drill string get into that rotational mode where we're stimulating it and, and causing our uh, vibration downhole or, uh, or, uh, or differential sticking. Uh, this one is really key because what ends up happening is it typically destroys other equipment. And so what ends up happening is it's, it's kind of a, a good testing ground for making sure that our BHA is in sync with what we're trying to do from a drilling perspective. The last one I want to talk about is kind of the, the directional drilling process. Since we're all drilling, you know, or most operators are now drilling, you know, multi-well pads and, uh, all curves and laterals, the majority of everything, is having the ability to, to take that oscillator that the machine is running, take that back to drilling that, that, the, that the rig is running, taking that weight on bit and RPMs that the rig is running, taking the fact of how we're going, where we're gonna go with the well and the well bore and running that into an automated process to where we can actually drill those directional curves from with, from or auto, for automated purposes. All the aspects that you needed to understand on each one of those spots, the oscillator, back to drilling, uh, ROP enhancement, uh, drill string uh, vibration, all of that takes place in the automated directional drilling path. So if you can imagine all those four working together, now you can actually see yourself getting on that path 
of how we can actually automate the drilling process. However, I will say that the, the driver still is making sure we understand the direction in which we are going. Uh, the, how, what does the map look like? Where are we going? It, it is not self-seeking. It can't, it doesn't have eyes on it. We have to tell it where it's going. And I think that's the, the side of automation that we probably don't spend enough time on. And, and, I, and, I'm, and, and every time that we've had uh, extreme great success, it's, it's been around the fact that we communicated the direction we need to go and the way that map looks. And when we've had failures, you can point right back to the fact is, is that it was a communication failure that we didn't know something was, was gonna happen on that roadmap. <coughs> Thank you very much, Jim, for the for the time to, to talk. And if there's any questions, I would be glad to, uh, to answer them. You bet. If there's any questions, you can post them in the Q&A or the chat. <coughs> Great job. Yep, good job, Troy. Yeah, Enrique's mm -hmm. applauding quietly. Yeah, so. <laughs> it, it's a round of applause, right? You know, it's going around. OK, so. Uh, <coughs> You have, did I give you control? No, uh, no, I've got control. Okay. You, you don't think I would actually cede control, do you? No. <laughs> no, I would, no. All right. We'll let uh, Enrique uh, introduce himself. These young guys know all about this stuff. Thank you. Let's see, do I have a video? <laughs> awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. And I would like to thank IADD for this opportunity for allowing me to present some of the projects that I've been working on recently and for Jim to invite me over and for, for you to, to be here and listen to me. My name is Enrique Lozoya. I'm a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University, just around block from here. Um, and I wanted I wanted to start this conversation by talking about two projects that I recently worked on that are related to automating the drilling process and machine learning, mostly on the simulation side of things. So the agenda for today is we'll start by talking about a drilling simulator that we I had an opportunity to work with that was meant to be a horizontal directional drilling trainer to train new drillers that came into the field. Then we'll go and talk about the automated dysfunction identification and short hop system, the prototype and early development the stages of that, that system. And then and during the past seven weeks, I have had the opportunity of being part of a National Science Foundation funded program where they encourage researchers and academics and students to talk with industry experts. So we talked with more than a hundred people in the industry and got some initial takeaways. And then I'll just share my thoughts on the future automation, machine learning and simulation and where I believe things are going towards. So the first project was, we, I had the opportunity to be part of the development team to model a horizontal directional drilling operation. They, they tasked us to model the drill rig that you see on the left-hand side and model the whole drilling operation, including the well pad uh, provided on the right-hand side of the screen. We not only needed to model the dynamics of the surface drilling rig, but also the dynamics of what's actually happening down hole. And the operator provided us with a bottom hole assembly configuration. Now, this is meant to train new engineers. So everything has to run in real time. And by real time, I mean maybe 30 to 60 times per second. The calculations have to be fast enough so that they don't feel that delay. Uh, we had to simulate the real time physics and including the bit probe orientation, rate of penetration, the interaction between the bit uh, and, and the, the earth model, 
the drill string dynamics, deformation, some some drill string frictions, and of course, simulate the problem measurements that the new drillers will be training. In addition to that, we coupled several components together, including the hardware, and created a copy of the actual controls that they that the new drillers will actually be, do, be using once they get into the field. So just for you guys to have an idea, uh, a, 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 new, a new driller had to shadow the experienced driller for up to two years and with an average of six months before they were actually left alone in the field. So, well, on the right-hand side, you see two of the three components, the hardware components, and then the visualization aspect of the simulation. But there is also another third component that was happening behind, which is the real-time models either derived from analytical solutions uh, using iterative methods or derived from empirically derived uh, formulas. And of course, for the end user, everything had to look great. So we had a 3D engine that was getting all the data from what was happening back in the back end and visualizing this data on a 3D environment, similar to a, a video game engine. It's actually a video game engine. Now, in the back end, we needed to perform real-time simulation of what's actually happening down hole. And the simulation had to be accurate enough so that it runs in real time. And it, it's accurate enough so that the new readers will experience something similar when they are uh, faced with the real thing. So for that, we developed several different models of the drilling operation uh, in order to simulate those and have those interact with each other via threads on, a, on C++. And here are some of the models that we had to develop from wellbore pressures to torque and drag. Uh, we implemented uh, 3D spine interpolations, stiff models for torque and drag, jet bit hydraulics, and of course, some of these models run real time, some others do not, and so on. Now, for the drill string dynamics, we use we use a methodology and a tool that basically we have solid body dynamic solver and model each one each component of the drill string as a solid body connected with torsional string elements, and then the simulation runs. Now, this simulation doesn't run in real time, but it was accurate enough and fast enough so that we could model at least the beginning of the operation. And then we have uh, proxy models to run in real time once they go through a different part of the drilling process. One of the key takeaways from this, uh, this uh, simulation was that the drillers had to experience something unknown on the rock. And sometimes they had to Real and sometimes they had to jet since this is very shallow unconsolidated formations. So for us to simulate that shallow unconsolidated jet wing process, uh, we relied on a we relied on a methodology and a framework we originally developed by DreamWorks Animation Studios to generate and render what you see in in 3D animation movies like. The, clouds and these volumetric bodies. Anyways, that, that tool and that framework allow us to allow us to have a particle-based simulation system and each particle can have several parameters. And that's how we uh, we use that's how we, we came to the development of the erosion model when the jet is not drilling but it's actually just the bit is not drilling but it's actually just jet flying through the rock. Um, and then we integrated that eroded volume over time to generate this uh, simulated output of the original well plan for the driller based on the, on the other models. That tool was actually reused um, a few months after the fact, but instead of simulating data and, and capturing that data, we used high frequency downfall information from a short run uh, from an, an oil and gas well then we integrated that this that data into um, this volumetric uh, approach, and that's kind of a 3D capillary used by looking at downfall dynamics. Yes, there are integration errors, 
and it may not be as accurate, but it's a good start, I, I would say. Uh, now, a, another project was the automated dysfunctional identification and short hop telemetry system, which is based, what we wanted to do here is prove an, an improved version of the electromagnetic inter, uh, of an electromagnetic transmission system and have a dysfunctional identification library or a classification templates so that we could capture to see if there is a dysfunction happening down hole or up hole and then send the flags in almost real time from a tool located near the bit to the surface so that we could save bandwidth and optimize our limited bandwidth and telemetry systems. How do you communicate that though? If you're down hole, what's the method of it's it's a it's an electromagnetic short hop telemetry system. So you have a series of repeaters um, from down for, from down hole to to the, to the uh, drill, drill, drill down pipes. Yes, EM. So the objective was to improve upon what's what's in the state of art. And uh, so for, from the hardware perspective, we tested the models and the the EM models that we had on derive on an FE using finite element methods on a, on a swimming pool. This is the initial, er, very early prototype, but what we simulated was in accordance with what we tested for those specific conditions. So that was quite interesting. Now for the dysfunctional identification library, we couldn't get our hands into a lot of downhole data. So we, we had to resource on what's out there. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but the ball field, was a field drilled by Equinor a few years ago. They and they recently open sourced everything. All the data is there, and it's on a WebSML based file. You have data from seismic to drilling to logging data, also production data, including the reservoir simulators and reservoir simulation files. So we, we extracted the WebSML data into a consolidated file, and then then applied supervised and unsupervised machine learning methods so that we could start to detect if there was a dysfunction based on surface measurements uh, of about sticks live on world, which were the first ones to, that we wanted to tackle. On this slide, you see uh, the different models that we used and the accuracy of those models. These results are cross-validated for the whole data set of that, the WebSML data for the ball, for all both wells. And even though the random forest classification technique was more accurate down the road we actually we actually we actually found that deep narrow networks perform better and didn't overfeed our training samples now some of the industry okay another project that i wanted to talk about today is so as i said before over the past seven weeks we interviewed more than 100 individuals in the industry uh, from decision makers to end users, drill engineers and drillers uh, as part of a National Science Foundation program called the i program. And they encourage academics and people like, like us or like, like myself, I, I, get, I would say, like myself to get out there and see what the end users are actually facing and what kind of problems they have. And so that we could have a better understanding of what, what are their, their pain points and how could technology be applied to solve those problems. So in six, six or seven weeks, we interviewed over a hundred people. And if you see your face in there, that's, <laughs> thank, thank you very much for your time again. I'm still tabulating all the data that we got, all the data we got it because I, I mostly use pen and pencil uh, and a notebook to get all these data points. But here are some of the initial takeaways. I mean, it may be, it may be information that industry folks are already aware of, but perhaps academics, or at least in my, in my position, I wasn't really afraid, uh, aware of. So the first hypothesis that we wanted to test was, is this low drilling a crucial problem for the drilling? Yeah, well, we found out, that, yes, generally avoiding delay, but avoiding delays and failures are, are more critical. And that, you know, they're usually, no one has ever gotten fired for drilling or using a proven met methodology. So the drill engineer motivation or the driller motivation usually doesn't 
uh, align very well with the operator motivation or the service company models. Now, what are some of the unmet needs in the industry field? Most, most people, and here are the ones that, are, that were most frequently brought up, downhole communication bandwidth, it's an issue. And most, from, most service companies or service companies providers brought this issue up. However, from the operator side, they said, yes, well, but it doesn't really matter if we have more bandwidth, we will have all the data from downhole, but if we cannot have, we don't have time to start looking at this data 24 seven. So it will be more interesting for me to have actionable information from downfall more often instead of having all the raw measurements. So I believe that a reliable automated trade analysis and drilling system or drilling advisor system is more critical than just increasing uh, increasing downfall communication. Out of the hundred, I, 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 I am aware that there is wire drill pipe out there as well, but out of the hundreds, uh, interviews, interviewees that we had, only two people were actually using wire drill pipe in the field, and those were overseas. So, and they also complained that it's usually much more expensive. So they didn't see a lot of value in that. Now, automated just steering, pollution avoidance was also brought up. High temperature microelectronic devices, especially now that gas and geothermal drilling has picked up, um, and then the field level optimization and the so-called upscaling problem, where yes, you have models for a specific different condition, a specific different problem. So how can you make these models communicate together, talk, talk together and add seismic information, perhaps reservoir information, reservoir engineering information, have a system of systems or a digital twin of the whole field so that you could start optimizing those. And that's not a trivial problem to solve. Uh, however, it's something that people are interested in. And then what are the key critical performance indicators? So the most important one for most people was cost followed by safety and then speed as well, but not speed without consistency. Now, um, lastly, before uh, to finish my talk, I kind of wanted to provide some thoughts of, you know, where I see drilling automation going in machine learning. And I want to stop, uh, stop a little bit and say, and ask you guys if you have ever thought about immortality for a moment. And if you could say, what if, you know, what if we come up with a pill that allows us to live forever and without aging and without any health issues? How would that change society, right? And I want you to kind of think of this and, and, and read this following paragraph. And I'll give you 30 seconds to read that paragraph so that you start diving into this hypo hypothetical. This is just one paragraph of several paragraphs of that essay. And I wanted to ask you, this was written by Samuel. Who do you think Samuel is? Do you think Samuel is an undergraduate student or a college student that wrote painter. this essay? He's a painter. Painter, painter, perhaps, or uh, maybe a uh, philosophy professor. Uh, what about what about a monkey? What if I tell you that the, that paragraph, not a single line was changed, and it was written by a computer? That paragraph, verbatim, was written by a deep learning trained neural network uh, and is the state of the art in national language, national language, sorry, excuse me. Uh, yeah, neural, neural language processing, natural language processing is the state of the art from Silicon Valley and the Silicon Valley folks. And that was just released last year. But however, every single part of that paragraph was written by a machine. And the machine has not only, not not only can approximate human-like writing, but they, it can also code. And it could also start developing. There are some use cases of this, this train network developing websites. Now, looking at these advancements, 
this um, natural language processing advancement from Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley companies are usually the ones that are uh, leading the efforts. And until January of last year, you could see that the, that the best deep learning trained neural network for this kind of uses was led by Microsoft and it was trained on about 17, 17 uh, billion different parameters. Wow. Now, the one that wrote the text that you just saw was trained by an order of on an order of magnitude more of data. And it was released in May of 2020. And it's, it's made by OpenAI, which used to be a nonprofit. Uh, and now, and this network is called GPT-3, and is the state of the art on that, on the, that series of deep neural networks. And it used one, it was trained on 170 billion data points and, and information. And how did they gather <coughs> data points? Well, they gathered those data points from us. They had the whole, a whole copy of Wikipedia on their servers, a whole copy of the Library of Congress, several books as well, and they crawled the web using uh, you know, crawl, crawlers so that they, they could generate their database. Just so for you to have an idea, to train this type of network, to just hold the weights of the neural network in RAM, you need 700 gigabytes of GPU RAM. A normal customer level GPU less than a thousand bucks have perhaps four to eight gigabytes of RAM. So you need a ton of them. And just on, just on electricity and service providers cost to train this network once, it was estimated to be what, $5 million. And they had to train it more than once. And then you have to take into account the number of salaries or the, ex, the subject matter expertise that came into this. Yes, there's a, it's a ton of it. It's a ton of computational power needed to train the network. But the interesting thing is, once you have the network trained, you and I can look up that website and then call it, have a query, and use that network without this computational, this computational power. And that's a huge, that's a huge advantage. There's actually, you should look it up. This is a, a I posted the, the paper of this neural network, and they actually have a beta available if you are going to be using it for the good, for the good guys. So you could start using train network on your specific use cases. Now, it's been said that neural, deep neural networks are the ultimate function approximators because what they, what they usually try to do is, so they have, most problems are of high dimensionality and they exploit that high dimensionality and reduce that so that you could have a reduced order model of that high dimensionality problem without all the variables. Now, I want, there's also some other advances as you may call, have called. Functions, you, you, may, you may think of an of a image as a function, right? So I wanted you to kind of provide this example and let me know if you recognize this guy. And what you're seeing here is a deep neural network trying to approximate a picture of me, <laughs> try to come up with the best approximation of my face based on all the thousands of faces that it's been trained on. This is not a real picture with the best approximation based on what I give, gave it. And by the way, they were just a neat example that I wanted to show. And that picture's Yeah, it is. <laughs> that was before I got into the That's PhD program. <laughs> so if you want me to kind of run, have your video, you shoot me an email and I'll, I'll get your, your video up so you can show you why. Now, okay, you might say, okay, what does this have to do with drilling and simulation and engineering? Well. There is, some, there is a new trend called um, scientific machine learning in engineering and science, but AI machine learning has been used on data, mostly on, on data mining and processing, classification techniques, supervising and supervised methods, but also on the computation modeling. I believe there are a ton of approaches and ton of opportunities to tap into. For instance, you could use machine learning to approximate functions, as I said. So here's how the Lorentz system or the Lorentz equation, it's a, uh, it's more, these dynamics are modeled by this partial differential equation on 3D space. And the interesting thing here is that even though we have a really good deterministic understanding of the dynamics of the system, and we can model those dynamics using this PDE, uh, we don't really, the system is chaotic in nature, which means that you need to know the initial conditions and boundary conditions of the system so that you could have, could have 
could predict where that point is going to be further down over time. So it, it's a highly initial condition dependent problem. Now, if you use normal iterative solvers to get, generate a solution for that partial differential equation, then you could generate some data points. And then what you use is you use that data, those data points to train a neural network, which is basically a function approximator, for instance, and then have that trained neural network to uh, predict or to generate the dynamics without any solvers at all. On the left-hand side is the analytical solution of, of, of normal, the exact solution or most exact solution, I would say it's still numerically approximated. And then the right-hand side is the predicted output for the same initial conditions using a deep neural network. All right, so what about drilling simulation and automation? I believe that there is tons of opportunity where we can not only have more understanding of the downfall dynamics and downfall simulations, but also start creating uh, the so-called hybrid models where we have machine learning or data-driven or scientific machine learning-driven uh, models using traditional, using and using traditional simulation techniques, iterative solvers, combining those or combining pieces of the simulation to accelerate the development and to accelerate the simulation time without without undermining accuracy and this is ongoing work uh, we just started on the left hand side you're basically looking at one of the methodologies they have where you have a net deep neural network but you're also using some understanding of the dynamics and putting those as uh, put, putting those pdes or understanding of the dynamics as an input to the network and uh, <clears throat> and optimizing that network, um, optimizing the network using the loss function with those dynamics built in. It's just one example, but it's still ongoing work, and hopefully we'll get some more results for you guys later. Now, before I, I wanted, before I leave, I wanted to leave you with, you know, I believe drilling automation and research is uh, drilling in general. So, excuse me, automation and machine learning in general. You can see these trends, but drilling automation and anything is is still and will still be a very useful, uh, very, 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 of very interest of a lot of interest for people out there. On the left hand side, I create, I pull from one petrol, the pay six, around 6,000 pa papers that had drilling and automation in the title of abstracts. And I created this kind of war map of what are the most common uh, words for those papers and what are the most common words for those papers abstracts? And you could use that QR code on the left-hand side to go over to this kind of dashboard and dive into from 1960s to 2021, how many papers have been published with these keywords on this and uh, within which each discipline and sub-discipline of the drilling world. So with that, I would like to wrap up my talk. And I believe that you know, there is there's a ton of potential for us to automate based on science, scientific understanding, and numerical simulation work, and the new and borrowed technologies that are being used on other industries. And thank you very much for your time tonight, today. And I'll, here's my contact information. I appreciate your time, and thank you. Again. <laughs> If you have any questions, stop, 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 Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I'll just start. Thank you. Great presentation. Yes, great job. Good job. Appreciate it. Um, All right, so we're good. Uh, so we also have uh, Jesse Hill is on. And I see we, um, we have a few folks here that are still still engaged so is there if there's any questions you want to post them in the q a or raise your hand i can um 
I can get you uh, an opportunity for the microphone to come on. One of the things that uh, Shelly had mentioned to me while Enrique was doing is how well the presentations flowed from one to the next. Um, th this was actually unrehearsed uh, and, and unknown. The other presenters didn't know what the other ones were doing. And so I think it shows you that there, there was certainly a common thought and thread here. And I think that a lot of the actions that were proposed uh, and, and the gaps that we are currently experiencing and so forth are, are certainly consistent across a number of uh, understandings, you know, from, from Troy with the rig and technology company to Shelly with the, uh, the automation to Enrique with the work that he's doing at A&M uh, and in other places. Uh, I think this is the beginning of a, a good guideline to, uh, to start doing uh, some things with this. Uh, Shelly had, had said earlier as well that uh, we hope that this is just the first of these types of things. And in fact, we're involved in a number of, um, of standards uh, initiatives to, uh, to establish things from a, a, uh, a forensics analysis on bits and BHAs uh, all the way through that you know, how, how can we actually automate these things in, in the future? And I think one of the critical points that, that, I, that was a, almost a, that was a common thread running through uh, these things is the, the fact that we have to address the silos, that we can't have compartmentalized information uh, or you're not going to have an optimal solution. If you don't take into account the geological reservoir properties, you can't properly design a drilling program that's actually going to address uh, the actual value proposition of a well, which is to get hydrocarbons out of the ground. You know, we're not doing these to make land speed records. Although you, you wouldn't know that when you talk to some people, right? Obviously uh, speed and efficiency is important, but if you don't take the other elements into consideration, then uh, you know, we're, not, we're really gonna be spinning our wheels. Gotta find my mouse again. There we go. So I see we have one Q and A. Blaine uh, says, "How will we cope with the inherent uncertainties that we face in every well? Hole diameter uncertainty, wear rates on equipment, etc." Et uh, you know, I think that uh, that's a good question. Uh, Troy, do you want to you want to take that? <laughs> I read that and thought, wow, that's, a, <laughs> you know, uh, that is a really good question. I, I, Blaine, uh, I, my opinion obviously is historically that the information has, has to be available that says we normally uh, have, this interval has always been the 12 and a quarter hole and we'll have to do that. And, and what are the chances, uh, the, the statistic chances of us having to set pipe and make it, you know, eight and a half? What does that chances look like? It have to be dialed into the automation decision and the roadmap that you have to, to build for that. Um, I, I, you know, the the other spot of it is is that we don't do this anymore because we don't have a we don't have a mechanical device drilling well anymore. Wow. It used to be that when I talked to a customer about a rock bit, the first question was, how many hours is it going to take? Not how long will the teeth last, but how long will the, will the bearing last? And I'm wondering if that's necessarily, do we do the, I, I don't know, do we do the same thing with motors now? Do we, do, we, do we tell that, do we ask that from the suppliers? Does the motor actually last 90 hours every time? Or what is the, what is the, what is the percentage of 200 hour motors? I, I don't know that. Yeah, and, and I could kind of answer, he, he mentioned wear rates on equipment and Shelly Shelley touched on this with condition-based monitoring. I and mean, that's one of the biggest buzzwords that we hear uh, across industries, but you know, specifically in oil and gas, you know, where you, you have you know, different sensors that are monitoring different things, you know, bearing temperature, whatever it might be. 
And, you know, then you can incorporate things like machine learning that says, okay, once we, you see a vibration of this amount and a bearing temperature of this amount, you, this thing's probably going to fail within a certain amount of time. So, you know, rather than sending a bit down the well that has a likelihood of failing, you just pull that one out of service for repair and then you put a new one in. So uh, I think that's why we're seeing that be a, be a real uh, big buzzword these days. And actually for borehole quality too, that Blaine was asking about, you know, we used to do calipers and have a log from a prior well to see what zone you may be going through. You might expect to wash out or to maintain borehole quality. You need to know what you did before drilling a similar well and what you're yeah. doing during real time of completing that well. And we don't have that, right? So it starts from the data that NRK talked about and collecting all that data from all aspects. Even when I was at Baker, we might have been the one who logged the well, but we didn't have it when we were fracking and we had issues of trying to, you know, frack a well. But if you brought all that data together and then you knew from a vibration standpoint what the bit was doing, is it the bit and the vibration from formation or what's causing your, your inadequate borehole quality you want to maintain? And then what can you do from gather data, machine learning, real-time um, decision-making to correct, to get through that section, to have a good borehole quality, to have a good cement job at the end. So it's really kind of tying all the loose ends together um, to make sure that we can improve borehole quality. Well, and at this stage, do we even have a definition for borehole quality? <laughs> you know, no, what, no, what, no, we don't. <laughs> and if, if you have a definition, what's the fidelity? I mean, if you're looking at tortuosity based on 90 foot surveys, I mean, you know, you're, you know, go ahead and roll the dice. You know, it's a, it's a crapshoot as to what you really have. And not that I would accuse directional builders of hiding dog legs or tortuosity. I mean, that, that would never happen. No. I mean, you're supposed to get tens and you got a 22, right? You know, so yeah, that, that has almost no effect on the tortuosity of the well bore or, you know, your ability to get out to the end. So of course, I'm saying that very much tongue in cheek. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. I think I think Jesse's comment though is really good. And the fact is, is that uh, monitoring the uh, equipment is probably the best way of, of looking and deciding how to make changes. Uh, yeah. So, but but you know we like had this conversation the other day where you know so we have all this information now and where who's who's has it and who's storing it and who has access to it. Right. That becomes a, a big question too, because you know. Uh, so uh, neighbors drilled the and what quality? Is, what quality is it? Right, the information that you. Well, you know what? Feeding operators are feeding it to the different um, HMIs that they have right now. For oh, I call it the graphical user Corva, for example. Yeah, right. Every yeah. directional driller has access to that data of current well and legacy well. Right. So now there's been a trend because there was a big hesitant to give it up. Operators are collecting it. Some service companies collect it in pockets, right? Yeah. But the operators really are going to have to drive the sharing of that. And they usually only do it within their space that they're drilling. Right. And they only right. do it with parties that they're, they're wanting to get benefit from. So there needs to be a push for that, even if it is per operator for their well pads in an area that they're drilling to share all, right? And right. I think it's their, they're in the driver's seat to drive that. And once it's shared, then certain automations, machine learning, condition-based monitoring, you can see improvements of it, but it's looking at the data that you had historically, understanding where you sit, where do you want to be, and how do you auto-correct while you're drilling to get a better, a better. Yes, that's a really good idea. But. <laughs> we, we, you know, I guess the, the downside to it is, is that if I, I'm talking to Jim about drilling a well and I've got this information and Shelly doesn't, I'm not going to tell Shelly I got this information. I think you better tell Shelly. She'll she'll get it out of you one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, but I need to get the job first. So And, and I know that I can charge uh, more margin. I can get more margin out of this because I have this information. It, that's, you know, and, and I don't disagree with that. It's just. Right. Um, right. Well, my sense is, though, is that I'm starting to see some early signs of operators being more willing to share data. Um, I, I wouldn't, I would say like we're at the 10% point, you know, as opposed to zero, 
but you know, but it is actually moving. When when a company like Exxon Mobil indicates a willingness to share data, to make certain data public, uh, now they may not be sharing what's going off of onshore offshore Guyana, but you know there are areas that uh, that they are sharing data and that there is some collaboration. Now, like I said, very early stages of that. However, um, you know, I think it is starting to happen. Uh, and, and I got a feeling that, you know, as we, uh, the big crew change is finishing up, I have a feeling that uh, some of the reluctance for that sharing may be starting to go away. Yeah. Because that's the way it used to be done. It has to go away. It, it, it does. Yep. Garbage We've been in, garbage out. It for 20 plus years and, and different even service company like Baker had it yeah. where they collected every the logging they had everything on what formation and what depth of all the data right all of from drilling the motors and everything yeah. it's just not being used to help people get better next well plan. I'm glad some of those old people have moved on <laughs> Jesse you know your thoughts you know from coming from a little bit outside the industry on the observations that you've had, you know, looking at the presentations today, um, you know, what are, what are some of your observations? Well, you know, I think that, uh, it, it, I, so I've, I've been, you know, in, in kind of upstream, but, but not really on the drilling side, but, you know, it's the benefits of automation are, are cross industry, but, you know, I see a lot of the benefits, especially in oil and gas, because of essentially kind of the boom and bust nature of it, you know, and one of the big ones, um, and Troy talked about this, and I, you know, I think he used the term, you know, a, a driller has a bad day, or maybe you just have a driller that's inexperienced because you have, you know, these kind of booms and busts, you know, that, that's where automation can kind of close that gap, you know, when, when you're not, okay, price of oil, you know, we, we got a tanker that's blocking the Suez Canal right now, so that's, that's going to obviously, you know, change the price, not enough to, you know, make people hire a bunch of people, but there's all types of factors that, that affect our industry, right? So, you know, the, the different things that you can automate um, so that you're not having to retrain workforce uh, and that sort of thing, I, I think that's huge for our industry. Uh, the, other, the other kind of observation, you know, and this talks to what, what Shelly, Troy, uh, and, and all the presenters talked about, you know, we, we keep talking about data and that's the key to all this, right? I mean, condition-based monitoring, for instance, you know, that used to just be, okay, let's, you know, maybe you've got a vibration sensor and you just kind of monitor that. Well, now you've got a lot of sensors and they all provide data. And so you've just got this influx, this multitude, just terabytes and terabytes of data. So how do you analyze that? And that, that causes different uh, problems as well. So you've got so much data, where do you store it? And it, it, obviously the cloud is, 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 where most people store this stuff, but that can get expensive, especially when you're talking remote operations and you're having to send this through cellular networks, other things. So, you know, I think another thing that's really, and it's, it, this is not so much a buzzword, it's been around a while, but this idea of kind of edge computing. And that's something that, that we at Beckoff do a really good job with, where you take, because you have so much data, you have these sensors that, that are just creating again, just terabytes of data, you don't want to send that all to the cloud to analyze. You may only want to, you know, send 30 or 40% of it. When you have, you know, a, a device that's there at the, at the, at the drill site, whatever it is, uh, at the well pad, they can do some of that analysis, you know, there without having to send it up to the cloud. And then you just get faster feedback. You're not spending so much money to trans transport data. So, you know, we're all kind of figuring this stuff out and it all kind of starts with data. You know, how, how do you, make use of that data, how do you improve it? Uh, and again, you know, we also have the, the, the issues we just talked about. No one wants to share their data either, right? So there has to be a collaborative effort and you're seeing a lot more of that, you know, within the industry, within the process industry itself. I mean, there's a lot more collaboration going on where even in an automation world, we typically have had, you know, a specific vendor talks one language, you know, com communication language and another automation vendor talks another language. So the only you've got a device from one vendor, a device from another vendor. Now you've got some gateway or, you know, a converter in the middle of it. So there's a big push within the industry just to get to more of the standard, kind of like you have in the IT world. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing IT and OT converge. It's another huge buzzword, um, but it is, you know, the IT standards are standards and we're seeing a lot more of that standard, you know, in, in the, in the process world and in that industrial communications world. And, you know, again, that's, I don't want to sit here and make this a Beckoff commercial, but that's where, 
you know, PC based control, we kind of, we're already kind of on that, on that path. So long winded question or answer to your short question. I hope, I hope that made some sense. No, no, I think, I think that is good. I think that's, that's a good segue. We can go ahead and wrap this up for today, but the emphasis is on for today. I think these types of discussions are very important. Uh, you know, I agree with uh, Shelley that we, we need to continue to have these types of things, uh, try to engage a larger and larger audience. Uh, I think we're going to have to do that intentionally. You know, that, uh, hey, look, but I, I think, I think the, big, um, the big objective for us really is to define the prize. I think if you can define what the prize is and uh, demonstrate uh, conclusively what the value is, then I think you attract your interest. My sense is, and maybe Enrique, uh, he, may, he may add to this, but my sense is, is that most of the interest today is almost like a gut feel that people have not necessarily quantified what that prize is, what the value uh, is to that. You know, so you know that that's probably a good objective. Would you agree with that, Enrique? Um, absolutely. I believe that. Well, first of all, yes, we were talking about where the value how can we avoid having different resources and diminish resources. Uh, but then, what are we going to get from it? There has to be a risk assessment and uh, economical assessment of if this is actually valuable for the end user. And then when it comes to data, I will say that more than having more data, I will argue and ask for more curated and consensual data. They, they use cases that are excellent. Everyone has, uh, agrees that this is what happened. We all have a good understanding of what happened and what happened, why did it fail? And then we will start studying that for them. Because most of the time, yes, you have the data from several sources. The data is not the same. The data is not clean. The data is not curated. You don't have that expert and subject matter expertise input linked with the data. So as researchers, um, and as researchers, how can we, or as employees from in the industry, how can we derive value from data that we don't really understand? Yeah. How, how can we speak an algorithm to give us the answers from empirical experts? And yeah. that's what we do. Especially when it's cross discipline. Exactly. Yeah, how's a drilling engineer interpret a geological answer? Okay. And then how does that translate to a risk? And especially when we, in, within a fragmented industry like yes. the one we are in. Yes. Side of the right. that's, that's a real right. challenge. Right. Right. And I hope we can overcome that. Yeah. So I, I think we've given ourselves a big to-do list. Uh, <laughs> would, would you agree, Troy? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And, and so Shelly's been taking copious notes and she put your name next to all, all the techniques. <laughs> Since you're not here to defend yourself or Perfect. get hammered. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, let me give you my phone number. Yeah, that's <laughs> really cool. 888. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something something in that effect. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for the participation. Um, I think this is a good starting point. It's a good catalyst. Uh, oftentimes, it's good to have a small group uh, to, uh, to start initiating the process. So uh, everybody keep a look out for future events and uh, Guys, I'd say, you know, with the, with the folks that have been involved in this, that uh, we'll set up a um, we'll set up another call soon. And, you know, see what we can do to attract uh, further engagement. I think I think if we if we just start something, I think it's going to attract interest. I think people are just looking for a flag to rally around, uh, so that, uh, that you know, we can go ahead and get started. So. Anybody else have any other further comments? I'll just say this was this was very interesting. Uh, Joy and Enrique and, and Troy, both both your presentations were very thought provoking. So appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, no, they, yeah. They, 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 everybody did a good job. Yeah. Everybody did a good job. So good. Thank you. Thanks again. I'll go ahead and sign everybody off. Uh, I think we have some tersaceous that we need to get for dessert. Uh, so. <laughs> That's no problem. No problem. <laughs> yeah. All right.